What's up, Wisecrack? Michael here. And today we're talking about cinema's other coin flipping nihilist. While most agree that No Country for Old Men is brilliantly made, some were frustrated to see a high octane Western end with an unsatisfying monologue about dreams and not with a hotly anticipated showdown. How'd you sleep? I don't know. I had dreams. Well, you got time for them now. Anything interesting? There always is to the party concerned. So what gives? What on earth does this conclusion mean? And why did the film end not with a bang, but with a whimper? Let's find out in this Wisecrack edition on the philosophy of No Country for Old Men. And as always, spoilers ahead. All right, guys, let's do a quick recap. Adapted from author Cormac McCarthy's 2005 novel of the same name, No Country kicks off when cowboy Llewellyn Moss stumbles across a desert drug deal gone wrong. In a moment of weakness, Moss steals a briefcase that contains $2 million of a large corporation's money, prompting them to send ruthless murderer Anton Chigurh after him. Meanwhile, aging sheriff Ed Tom Bell is tasked with following Chigurh's grizzly trail in an attempt to reach Moss before Chigurh does. The corporation sends another train killer after Moss, and a Mexican cartel makes its own grab for the cash, killing Moss in the process. There are more gruesome slayings, the money vanishes, and Chigurh gets away, prompting a despondent Sheriff Bell to hang up his spurs. In the end, Bell reflects on what happened and muses on a pair of seemingly unrelated dreams. Cut to black. Part one, classic westerns. To understand what exactly is going on in this movie, we'll have to start at the beginning. In the film's early scenes, the Coen brothers borrow tropes from the classic western genre. Take the opening sequence, in which sweeping landscapes are contrasted with roads, power lines, and other man-made structures, a juxtaposition common in classic westerns that highlights the American settler's struggle to tame a chaotic wilderness. Similarly, classic westerns often deal with justice, as settlers attempt to erect societies and administer law and order. These movies rely on neat binary archetypes and symbols. Film scholar Will Wright lists some of these simple oppositions in his book, Six Guns and Society. A character is inside or outside of society, strong or weak, good or bad. These clear divisions imply an absolute morality that the lawmen must justly enforce. Enter Sheriff Ed Tom Bell, who wears an actual white hat, a classic indicator of virtue, and comes from a long line of sheriffs. My grandfather was a lawman. Father, too. Throughout the story, Bell believes that, as an agent of the law, he is bound by a strict moral code. What is it Torbert says about truth and justice? Oh, we dedicate ourselves daily anew. Something like that. I'm gonna commence dedicating myself twice daily. Might come to three times before it's over with. Bell is an almost flat representation of the justice-seeking good sheriff. In contrast, Anton Chigurh seems to represent the classic Western bad guy. He's dressed in black, and when we first meet him, he's in handcuffs, immediately indicating his lawlessness. Oh, and if you weren't sure, he does this. Later, we see Chigurh shoot a bird for no reason. Another hallmark of the Western villain, often called a kick the dog moment. Famous examples of this include The Searchers, and Hondo, all of which feature bad guys killing or abusing a dog, letting us know that they are the worst. This trope is also spoofed in Blazing Saddles, and even in the Coen brothers' own Raising Arizona. So at first glance, it seems like No Country could be a classic Western, but the Coens quickly complicate things. Part two, revisionist Westerns. Sheriff Bell's opening monologue hints that times have changed, and so is crime. You can't help but compare yourself against the old timers. Can't help but wonder how they'd operated these times. Later, he and Wendell find the burning car Chigurh left behind, and when Bell theorizes that Chigurh changed vehicles, they have this exchange. That's very linear, Sheriff. Age will flatten the man, Wendell. Here, Bell acknowledges that this old dog can't keep up with the new tricks of the modern West. In other words, Bell, a relic from classic Western's past, can't comprehend this new reality, which seems to be more akin to the next phase of Western films, revisionist Westerns. Starting in the 1950s and 60s, Westerns began to shift away from focusing on lawmen to focusing on outsiders and anti-heroes. These movies, sometimes called revisionist Westerns, depict a morally gray or morally relativistic world in which people have to adapt to survive. In his book, The Six Gun Mystique Sequel, historian John G. Cowaldy explains that revisionist Westerns often display critical and ironic attitudes towards some of the most traditional myths associated with the Western, such as that of the heroic gunfighter. In other words, revisionist Westerns are modern stories in a classic Western setting 
that grapple with America's disillusionment and soul searching. So in No Country for Old Men, Belle is juxtaposed with Llewellyn Moss, the actual hero, or rather the revisionist Western anti-hero of the story, who does dubious things like steal briefcases full of money, but then returns to the crime scene to bring a dying guy some water. Rather than a white hat wearing paragon of justice, Moss is an opportunist attempting to navigate a morally ambiguous world. Another kick the dog moment further distinguishes our two heroes. Early on, Moss is forced to shoot an aggressive dog. Minutes later, when Belle and Wendell arrive at the scene of the drug deal, they're horrified that the bad guys also kill the dog. Oh, hell's bell. They even shot the dog. One that looks nearly identical to the one Moss shot. Here, Belle's clear cut ideology is complicated by the morally ambiguous situation Moss encountered. Another important aspect of revisionist westerns has to do with the nature of justice. In these movies, justice often takes the form of karma, or a you reap what you sow kind of cyclical retribution rather than coming from the law. Thus, people who live by violence often die by violence. We see this version of justice when Moss, on the verge of death, crosses into Mexico and is extorted for money. Look, you gotta give me this money. I got no other reason to protect you. The scene creates a kind of cyclical moral logic. Moss is reaping what he has sown. When he wakes up in Mexico, the song a mariachi group sings translates to, you wanted to fly without wings. You wanted to touch the sky. You wanted too much wealth. You wanted to play with fire. In the revisionist Western tradition, no country seems to suggest that justice might come from outside the law, but it does still exist and is understandable. But there are still elements that complicate this understanding and perhaps suggest that there is no justice to be had. Part three, chaos reigns. Let's get back to Chigurh. At first, he seems to be a flat, traditional villain, but he's actually much more complex. Take this pivotal gas station scene. A traditional baddie would just murder the station owner, but instead, Chigurh leaves the man's fate up to chance. Is something wrong? With what? With anything. Is that what you're asking me? Is there something wrong with anything? Here, he mocks the very notion of right or wrong. In other words, Chigurh is not, in fact, a strictly evil force, but rather an agent of chaos. Similar, although we see Chigurh shoot the bird in a classic kick the dog moment, the next time he encounters an animal, the cat in the hotel, he leaves it alive. Chigurh's actions again seem random and don't follow any apparent rules except the rule of unmitigated chaos. Chigurh explains this to Carla Jean Moss at the end of the film when he insists that she call a coin toss to decide her fate. Carla Jean attempts to reason with Chigurh, but he rejects her logic. Call it. The coin don't have no say. It's just you. Well, I got here the same way the coin did. In Chigurh's mind, there is no order, only chance. Another way the Coens sow chaos is by introducing interlopers, characters who functionally introduce unpredictability or chance. Author H. H. Monroe, aka Saki, popularized this idea with his 1911 short story, The Interlopers. In the tale, two men face off in the forest to settle a family feud. But after getting pinned under a fallen log, the men instead make peace, only to both get eaten by wolves, the eponymous interlopers, at the end. In No Country for Old Men, there are many interlopers who randomly and unexpectedly interfere with the plot. We meet our first interloper right at the outset. Moss shoots a deer, but a black dog comes out of nowhere and steals the wounded animal for himself. In fact, the dying man Moss encounters warns him that more interlopers lurk nearby. I Lobos, there are wolves. Moss insists. There ain't no Lobos. But when he goes back to bring the dying man some water, he does indeed encounter wolves in the form of the Mexican drug cartel, who function throughout the story as unpredictable interlopers. Clearly, in the Coen's West, chaos reigns. But the film's strongest rejection of all Western tropes really coalesces in the third act, as things get even weirder. Chigurh has the opportunity to reclaim Moss's stolen money, but he's like, nah. You could have the money, Anton. Why? Because as we've seen, Chigurh isn't here to make money or sense. His violence is chaotic and nihilistic and rooted largely in the notion that fate is an uncontrollable force ruling over all our lives. Enter 
the neo-Western. Note that genre terms are constantly contested by theorists who might call No Country a new Western, late Western, postmodern Western, or any other number of terms that exist to make us feel a little crazy. But others consider it just to be the next phase of the revisionist post-Western tradition. But we're going to use the term neo-Western as it's conventionally understood to mean contemporary-ish stories that incorporate generic Western themes and tropes to critique the mythos of the West, while also incorporating other genres ranging from noir to horror. So anyway, the neo-Western, of which no country is basically a poster child, is often characterized by a much darker vision of the American West. Importantly, as scholar Lee Clark Mitchell explains in his book, Late Westerns, these films will typically trust that its viewers understand the language of the Western and use our familiarity to undercut our expectations. Because the Coens know that will register the cinematic language of the film, from the Stetson boots to the distinctive Texan drawl as Western, they can have fun playing with our minds and hearts. This is where we need to note that neo-Westerns, including No Country, often pull heavily from the traditions of another classic American film genre, film noir. This is nothing new for the Coen brothers, who have been called the epitome of the neo-noir impulse in the 21st century. Their genre f***ing instincts are certainly on parade in no country. This is clear from the opening sequence. We already went over the way wide-angle shots of sprawling landscapes are shown to situate us in a comfort zone of the classic Western. At the same time, though, these images are accompanied by Sheriff Bell's 90-second voiceover about his own life, feelings, and reactions to societal violence. He killed a 14-year-old girl. Papers said it was a crime of passion, but he told me there wasn't any passion to it. This technique is far more characteristic of noir films, which frequently make use of voiceover to establish mood and give insights into the psychological plight of a protagonist. You say to yourself, how hot can it get? And then in Acapulco, you find out. I knew she had to wind up here because if you want to go south, here's where you get the boat. This immediately establishes the two genres with which the film will wrestle. The Coen's noir intentions are also signaled to us when Carla Jean watches Flight to Tangier on a black and white TV, a classic noir film that actually mirrors the plot of No Country, featuring a hunt for a massive amount of money and three central characters zipping around in automobiles and crossing country borders. Throughout its two tense hours, no country fully employs noir language. If I was into cutting deals, why wouldn't I just deal with this guy, Sugar? Oh, no. <laughs> you don't understand. You can't make a deal with him. Even if you gave him the money back, he'd still kill you just for inconveniencing him. So much so that Mitchell argues that the film basically has dueling genres, with the Western literally facing off against the film noir in a way that our villain never fully faces off with the hero. This is seen in a number of ways. The film quickly abandons the open desert for the dark interiors of motels and cars, far more typical of the film noir, which frequently explores themes of lost morality in the labyrinth of modern life. High contrast lighting also abounds, with many a lone character sitting in a janky room lit by a long suffering lamp. There's also extensive use of high and low angle shots, which serve to disorient us and disassociate us from our characters. At the same time, the film leans heavily on aggressively intense close-ups that create a sense of profound isolation, which is only magnified by the tendency of each character to be alone on screen. What's more, the plot, rather than being straightforward, is filled with cul-de-sacs that serve only to disorient us, like the late introduction of and near immediate disposal of Carson Wells. All of the above, again, are typical of film noir. Viewed this way, Sheriff Bell is basically a classic Western character airdropped into a neo-Western, hence his utter bewilderment at the violence and depravity that surrounds him. Llewellyn Moss, as a revisionist Western character who is morally gray but still someone you can root for, has also been transported to a neo-Western world where a fundamental sense of justice doesn't really exist. Instead, the film ultimately stays true to more classic noir themes that the world is filled with inexplicable evil, and that humans are helpless against the forces of fate. As scholar Christopher Wells put it, every film noir is the shadowland of a lost paradise, a fallen state, depicting the American city's underbelly as a world of violence and chaos. Sound familiar? But the Coen's ultimate subversion of audience expectations happens during the climax. Whether we're watching a classic or a revisionist Western, or a comedy thriller about a diaper-clad senior executive, we expect the hero and villain to face off, 
but instead, a random unknown character takes Moss's life. Off screen. No showdown with Chigurh, no reunion with Carla Jean. Just the ultimate narrative blue balls. And this is where we have to talk about violence in the Western. Typically, violence in classic and to some extent revisionist Western films can bring about justice. The good guy kills the bad guy and all's good in the world. But in no country, violence does nothing. It's so purposeless, in fact, that eventually it just disappears entirely, with both Carla Jean and Llewellyn's deaths occurring off screen. With violence ultimately amounting to nothing, there will be no justice in the Cohen's dark vision of the American West. Or will there be? Later, we're teased with the possibility of a climactic confrontation when Bell goes back to Moss's hotel room and we see Chigurh waiting inside. It's time for a face-off, right? Not so fast. Instead, all we get is nothing more than his shadow on the wall, a nod to the showdown we all wanted. The shot perfectly shows the film's fundamental tension between Western and noir tropes, featuring classic noir shadows while depicting your typical Western cowboy who has literally become a shadow of what he once was. However, there's one last opportunity for cosmic justice when Chigurh gets into a random car accident and we can hear the police approaching. Is some kind of higher power providing justice? Nope, he just pays off some kids who like all the other characters fight over the money. And Chigurh, chaos personified, walks off into the sunset like the Western hero he most definitely isn't. In the end, it's a lot of WTFs for the audience. Like Bell, we don't understand why higher powers, i.e. the filmmakers, are denying us any morally sound sense of justice. If any form of justice prevails, it's Chigurh's, who at least makes good on his promise to kill Carla Jean. I'm a man of my word. <laughs> this perverted vision of justice feels much more film noir than Western. Meanwhile, Bell has given up, essentially admitted defeat, almost as the Western admits defeat in the face of the nihilism of film noir. Later, when Bell reflects on the inexplicable crimes, he expresses his desire for meaning from a higher power, again sounding like a character from a film noir regretfully looking back on his life. I always figured when I got older, God would sort of come into my life somehow. He didn't. I don't blame him. Surprise him, I'd have the same opinion to me that he does. Bell's closing monologue reflects on our desire to be comforted with morally satisfying outcomes. But as we're about to see, that won't happen for Bell or us because chaos reigns. But what do you guys think? Is No Country for Old Men borrowing from Western tropes only to confound our expectations by concluding as a film noir? Or are the Coen brothers just cinema's most successful trolls? Let us know in the comments. As always, a big thanks to all our amazing patrons who support our podcast and channel. Hit that subscribe button, and as always, peace.